1994 was a transitional period for the personal computer. Vesa Local Bus was nearing its end of life to be superseded by PCI in the next year, the Pentium was beginning to hit its stride with the release of Socket 5, and the 486 platform had reached maturity with the introduction of Socket 3, allowing 3-volt CPUs and making a zero-insertion force socket standard. It was the dawn of the internet as we know it with the invention of HTML by Tim Berners-Lee in the year prior. 1994 was also a host to a chip shortage due to the issues with manufacturing defects and demand. It seems like it would have been a terrible year to build a new PC, doesn't it? Well, that's exactly what I did for the 486 build-off. I put together what I feel would have been the best bang for your buck 486 system you could have built in September of 1994. We're starting with the motherboard, an AOPEN VI-15G with 256 kilobytes of L2 cache and SIS-85C471 chipset. While this exact board dates from early 1995, the chipset itself, and most likely this model board, dates to 1994, and it makes for a rock-solid base for a build. You've probably seen this exact same model board on some other channels, such as LGR's Woodgrain 486, and there's a good reason why. It supports up to a 50 MHz bus, it has four 72-pin memory slots, three VLB slots, a standard CR2032 RTC battery, and has support for 3-volt CPUs. I've never come across stability issues on this board, no matter what I put in it. A really good find for $20 on OfferUp. For RAM, I originally put in this newer 16 megabytes of 72-pin FPM RAM, originally from a 1997 Compaq, but I ultimately decided on a period-correct set of Hitachi sticks totaling 8 megabytes because, as stated previously, there was a chip shortage in 1994, and the price of RAM nearly doubled in that year. This 8 megabyte kit probably cost upwards of $400, nearly $800 today when adjusted for inflation. And at the time, the only machines that would have had more than 8 megabytes of RAM would have been Pentium-based servers and workstations running things like Windows NT and CAD software. Because this motherboard lacks any onboard I.O. beyond the keyboard connector, we're going to need a Super I.O. card. And because I'm looking for speed out of the system, we're going with a VLB solution the QD6580W card, featuring the eponymous Vision QD6580 VLB IDE controller, and the ISA-based Winbond W83757AF floppy controller and I.O. controller chip for handling everything else. To finish off our VLB cards, I'm going with a generic Cirrus Logic GD5428-based 1MB VLB video card. Nothing flashy, but this is still a very fast and very compatible VLB-based SVGA chip from 1994. Because I host a lot of files for my older computers on my file server, we're going to need a network card. And the one I'm going with is not period accurate, but it's also the least headache inducing, so I'll make a concession. That being a generic Realtek RTL 8019AS based 10 megabit per second card with coax and standard RJ45. It still has drivers available directly through Realtek's website, including Windows 3.11 drivers and the DOS packet driver, which will come in handy when we install MTCP. To round off expansion cards, we have the sound card. I could have went with the run-of-the-mill 1994 Sound Blaster 16 value that I have in the box, but I wanted something a little more exotic. I could have gone for the 1993 Media Vision Pro Audio Spectrum 16 with excellent build quality and genuine OPL3 audio, but I would be sacrificing Stereo Sound Blaster Pro compatibility and resources on the computer. So instead, I decided on Media Vision's 1994 successor to the Pad 16, the Pro Audio 3D, flagship card for the Jazz 16 chipset. This card features full Sound Blaster Pro compatibility, genuine OPL3 FM synthesis, SCSI 2 interface for CD-ROMs, 3D SRS effects, well-made drivers similar to those of the Pad 16, and best of all, the ProWave, a Korg MBCS 35104-based 4MB Wavetable MIDI expansion board. This whole kit would have cost $199 in 1994, and was aimed at musicians looking for an affordable option for digital music creation, but its Wavetable is a perfect fit for DOS gaming as well. To complete the multimedia aspect of this build, we have this double-speed Mitsumi IDE CD-ROM drive. While quad-speed drives did exist in 1994, they would have been obscenely expensive for the performance you got out of them when not bought in a kit along with usually some cheap sound card. 
A pair of 1.44 megabyte and 1.2 megabyte floppy drives come in handy for software archiving, and in the context of this build, most likely would have come from a previous computer, along with the case and power supply. The hard drive was originally going to be this Western Digital Caviar 1.6 gigabyte drive from 1997, which was the smallest reasonable hard drive I had. However, shortly after building, I ran into some issues resulting in me having to use a much larger drive that I'll explain later. Now, realistically in 1994, you most likely would have had drives in the hundreds of megabytes of range instead of over a gigabyte. But one of the few concessions I make on pretty much all of my older computer builds is having a decent amount of storage space for programs, games, and everything else. Now for the focal point of every 486 build, the 486. I had a lot of options to choose from in September of 1994. Intel had released the DX4 in March, bringing clock tripling up to 100 MHz and 16 kilobytes of L1 cache to socket 3. However, that chip was quite expensive and still ran at a 33 MHz bus. You had offerings from Cyrix that included right back L1 cache at lower prices, but those typically ran slower than Intel CPUs or had strange incompatibilities. That leaves AMD, who this month would have released a range of new CPUs meant to compete directly with Intel's lineup at a fraction of the cost. They introduced their DX4 range of CPUs including 75, 90, and 100 MHz versions. But what I'm going to choose is the only DX2 introduced this month, the AMD 486 DX280, an 80 MHz chip that on paper sounds like it'd be slower than the higher clocked DX4 counterparts. However, this chip runs at a 40 MHz bus clock. This high bus speed should theoretically increase the performance across the entire system, including VGA and IDE performance over VLB if we can keep stability. First thing we need to do is prep the motherboard. These 486 motherboards typically had a ton of jumpers scattered around the board that had to be set differently for each type of CPU, and this board is not much different. Luckily, I have a printout of the jumper settings for this board, and we simply set the jumpers listed to 3.45 volt AMD DX2, then set the bus speed jumpers for 40 MHz, and finally set the VLB speed jumper to over 33 MHz. It's finally ready to be put all together. I'll start with the RAM, then the CPU with heatsink, and to finish off the motherboard, I plugged the fan into the Molex connector. Now onto the case. I install the floppy and CD drive into the case. Now to install the motherboard and hook up the front panel cables. With expansion cards, I start with the VLB cards. I install the Super I.O. card in the secondary VLB slot and the video card into the primary slot. I did this so the video card is prioritized in performance on the bus. I screwed in the COM2 bracket above the video card and installed the network card. Finally, I installed the sound card on the bottom slot as to keep it away from the hard drive to prevent noise interference. Now to hook up the power. Black to black on the mainboard AT connectors and connect the Molex cables for the drives. Next is to plug in the drive data cables, starting with the IDE cable. While plugging in the floppy cable, I realized I had to swap the CD and 5 and a quarter inch floppy drives as the floppy cable was too short to reach the floppy drive up top. After doing that, all the cables reached perfectly. And with that, this system is together. Let's get it back inside and set up. On first power on, it boots up right away. The hard drive already has MS-DOS 6.22 and Windows 3.11 on it, along with most of its drivers. So, setup is just a matter of removing the old Sound Blaster drivers and installing the driver package for the Pro Audio 3D. The setup and applications it comes with are very similar to the Pass 16, including the excellent graphical mixer utility, except now we have the added options for SRS and MTS enhancements. These turn on by default, but we can add this line to the autoexec.bat in order to disable SRS. For turbo mode, I reversed the cabling, so it's enabled when the system is at full speed and disabling turbo lowers the speed. I also set the front panel speed indicator values to 80 for full speed and just low for when turbo is disabled. As I stated earlier, the hard drive started acting up shortly after getting the system up and running, and eventually it completely corrupted its own partition table. So instead I went with a 40 gigabyte Seagate Barracuda drive that I sized down to 2 gigabytes using OnTrack. It's a pretty simple process of having some smaller capacity set in the BIOS so OnTrack will be able to detect the drive, then boot into the OnTrack software, 
navigate to maintenance utilities, select resize drive, and then input the number of sectors for two gigabytes of storage. Have OnTrack write the new size information to the drive and reboot. After booting into BIOS, you can have the system auto detect the drive and it now shows up as a two gigabyte drive. From here, I can F-disk and format the drive just as if it was an actual two gigabyte hard drive. I typically prefer this method of storage for these old systems rather than something like a CF card since it keeps the authenticity of the build in having a spinning disk while not requiring any adapters and it is also a much more reliable storage than any period accurate drives. After reinstalling MS-DOS, Windows 3.11, and all the drivers and software, we're ready for the second part. Running stability tests, testing the features of the sound card, and playing some games. Come back in part 2 when this 1994 Performance 486 build gets put to the test.